Well, greetings and a most heartfelt salutations, everybody. Welcome to the John Campia Show here on my YouTube channel. As always, I am your host, John Campia, and I am humbled and honored that you would spend part of your day hanging out with me and the rest of us here talking about our favorite things, movies and television and everything else in between. And this is the daily show that we talk about all that kind of stuff. Now, here's how today's show is going to go. I have picked out five topics and questions from emails that you guys have sent in to me. Now, how do you email a topic or a question into the John Campia Show? It's very simple. You just email me anytime at john at the johncampiashow.com. Once again, that's john at the johncampiashow.com. Send it on in. And here's two important things. Number one, make sure you put the word topic in the subject line. If you don't put that in there, I'm not going to see it. Also, make sure you keep your emails to 90 words or less. Otherwise, I'm not even going to bother reading it because it would even be too physically big to fit on the screen. Now, after I go through these email questions, I'm going to go to the live viewers because we are doing this show live. We do it live every single morning. And I'm going to take questions from those of you watching live on Twitter. How do you send in a live question? Wait till near the end of the show when we set up the time for it and just tweet me at John Campia. Just start your tweet with at John Campia and send on in your question. I'll let you know when you should start sending them in and maybe you'll see your tweet pop up on the bottom of the screen. Okay, guys, a lot of big stuff came out. A lot of things people are talking about. So let's get things started. And we start things off with the first question of the day. And the first question today comes to us from Ezra Rinsmith, who writes, Hey, John, I love your videos. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. My question is regarding The Gifted. Is The Gifted a Marvel or Fox property? I'm really confused because the pilot has a Stan Lee cameo and Marvel puts their name on it. But Mutants is a Fox-owned brand and there is a lot of mentioning of X-Men and the Brotherhood. Well, thanks a lot for the question, man. And yes, The Gifted, brand new show on Fox. By the way, the show is on Fox. Brand new show on Fox. And look, when I started seeing a lot of stuff from The Gifted at Comic-Con this past year, I admit... I didn't think it looked all that great. I didn't think it looked bad. Like, don't get me wrong. I didn't think it looked bad. But I also didn't think, eh, this is nothing special. I didn't think it looked all that great. And then I watched the premiere a number of weeks ago. And you know what? I'm impressed. I liked it. I thought it was quite good. I really like the fact that they're playing to the whole social persecution angle of it. Because that's suggested a lot in the X-Men movies, but they don't really go into it a whole bunch. And I find that this show really revolves around the social issues about what it means to be mutant, as well as cool powers and action sequences and stuff like that. I'm loving the characters. I love the two teenage leads. I think they're great. I like their mom and dad. I think they're really great. I still think the show needs a protagonist, or sorry, an antagonist. Right now, the Sentinel Services, just as an organization, is kind of your thing, but... Right now, just kind of the lackey dude, the bald dude, he's kind of the representation of the bad guy, but he doesn't do it well. He's a good, like, right-hand guy or lackey for a bad guy. The movie or the show needs a key antagonist. That's what it really needs. But anyway, getting back to your question, is it a Fox or is it a Marvel show? Well, remember this. The Spider-Man movies. Before there was ever a deal with Marvel, Spider-Man belongs to Sony. Stan Lee cameoed in those. Stanley cameos in Marvel character stuff. So just because he pops up doesn't mean it's a Marvel thing. And remember, the Marvel logo does pop up in front of all of the Marvel characters shows, even if they're Sony, even if they're Fox. So that's nothing. The Gifted is a Fox show. That's why it's on Fox. It's in the X-Men universe. Continuity, schmontinuity. It's sort of in the X-Men universe. It revolves around mutants and the mutant issue and stuff like that. It is very much a Fox show. But like I said, even before on the Spider-Man movies, you'll see the, the Marvel logo. You'll see Stan Lee cameos. This is not new. This is nothing different. It's just same old, same old. But you know what? If you haven't had a chance to check out Gifted, it's not like the greatest show of the year, but I'm impressed by it. I'm enjoying it so far. I find myself looking forward to the next episode. That's usually a good litmus test for me. If, if I'm into a show or not, am I actually like looking up to see when the next episode drops? And I find I'm doing that with the Gifted. So check it out. Let me know what you guys think of it when you have a chance to see it. All right, let's move on now to the next topic. And the next topic today comes to us from Gary John Stout, who writes, What's up, John? Do you have any info on Clive Barker's remake slash sequel on Hellraiser? Is it happening or not? Well, Hellraiser is one of those 
everybody who appreciates horror knows the name Hellraiser, right? It's not, he's not, you know, Pinhead isn't one of the big mega horror stars like a Freddy or a Jason or a Michael, things like that. But he's on that next, just that next level down. And people who know Hellraiser, maybe not all the sequels, but people who know Hellraiser appreciate Hellraiser. Now, a while ago, a couple of years ago, they said they were making another Hellraiser movie. So what's going on with it? Well, I can tell you this. It's done. The movie is done. It's completed. And it is coming out this year. However, as far as I understand, it is not being released theatrically. It's going to drop on video on demand and probably streaming services and Blu-ray and things like that. But it is not, as far as I understand, it is not getting a theatrical release. So it is coming. And actually, we pulled up a synopsis for it as well. Here's the synopsis for the new uh, Hellraiser movie. Detective Sean and David Carter are on the case to find a gruesome serial killer terrorizing the city. Joining forces with Detective Christine Egerton, they dig deeper into a spiraling maze of horror that may not be of this world. Gee, I wonder what that could be. Could the judgment awaiting the killer's victims also be waiting for Sean? Dun, dun, dun. So anyway, so there you go. So yes, the movie is coming. It is completely completed. It's ready to go. And it's just launching on video. When it's launching on video, where exactly we'll, we'll be able to find it, I don't know that yet at this point. But the, it is coming. So there you go. Put your mind at ease. Uh, if, by the way, you guys, especially you guys in the live chat board, if you know any additional information about... Uh, when and where we can expect to see that Hellraiser movie drop, please drop it in there and let everybody else know. Okay, let's go on now to the next question. And the next question today comes to us from one of my Patreon supporters, Cheese Warrior, who writes, I know you feel that physical media is soon going to die in favor of digital sales only. This upsets me because I'm an avid collector of special edition sets and steelbooks. To add that to my internet is pretty spotty, so streaming isn't always reliable. Do you collect such items, or do you exclusively buy digitally? And finally, how long do you think it'll be before buying digitally is the only option we have? Well, yeah, well, I've mentioned on the show before that I stopped buying physical Blu-rays and things like that a long, like years ago. I stopped buying that stuff years ago, and I realized you could get it all digitally, everything you can have digitally, you can take up no shelf space, you don't have to keep things in boxes, everything's just ready at the push of a button. On top of that, not only at the push of a button, but if I'm on a flight, I can just pull open my phone and start watching one of my movies. Can't do that with a Blu-ray, per se. And it's also a, an interesting sign of the times that everything is moving towards digital, when you can see right here that even movies are coming out and if you buy them digitally or you buy them uh, the physical copies, They'll include digital things. You can see that the industry is currently in the process of trying to condition the audience, you and me, to condition us and get us used to and get us ready for the full transfer from Blu-ray to digital. It's a lot easier for the studios to distribute. It's a lot cheaper for the studios to distribute because if the studios don't have to produce by Blu-ray cases with all the artwork and print the paper that goes in there and actually make the physical discs and then load them on trucks and airplanes and boats and ship them to all over the country, to all the stores and every place where they need to go. They can bypass all that and just put it up on their server and say, here you go. That makes life a lot easier for them. It makes life a lot easier for me because now I have all my movies on all my devices whenever I want to watch it at the drop of a hat. Granted, as long as I have an internet connection, but that's becoming less and less of an issue as every year goes by. So yeah, I haven't bought Blu-rays for ages. I still have like maybe 30 or 40 of them over there that I still crack out once in a while. But for the most part, all my stuff is on digital. My digital service of choice right now is uh, Google Play. Because I know Google's not going anywhere in the next 500 years. So all stuff's on Google Play. So all I have to do is open up my crew, hit Google Play, and whoop, there's all my movies. And I can do that there. I could do it when I'm visiting my parents' place up in Canada. I can do it when I'm on a plane with my phone. I can do it anywhere I am. So that's why I'm a big fan of that. Now, how long will it be, you ask, do I think until we see that full transfer? It's, we're still years away. We're still years away from that happening. How many years? I'm going to guess by 2023. I'm guessing by 2023, you won't be buying Blu-rays in stores anymore. By 2023. So that's just my guess. Maybe it'll be a little bit longer than that. Maybe a little bit shorter than that. And I know a lot of people really prefer, they really love having that physical copy in their hands. You know what I mean? I respect that. I got no problem with that. 
but it's just not for people like me and it is easier for the studios and the distributors to just put it out digitally and it is something that's probably going the way of the dodo bird it's probably going the way of lps but john lps made a comeback well yeah yeah that's true they did but they won't be long for much longer either um so that's the way I see things going, and maybe I'm wrong. Eh, maybe, and I hope for people like you who really enjoy the collector you know, instinct in you to own that physical Blu-ray disc, I, I hope I'm wrong. I hope you get to enjoy that for a long time. I just don't think that's the way it's going. Anyway, now, before I move on to the next question, guys, I want to remind you that this last question came to us from one of my Patreon supporters. So this will be my daily commercial break where I do my shameless plug. You know, I do this full time. I make videos on YouTube. It takes a lot of hours preparing these shows and all the graphics and the streams and stuff like that to put these shows together and all the videos that I do and watching all the content I got to watch. That means I do this full time and I'm only able to do that because of my Patreon supporters. Listen, guys, do me a favor. If you are somebody who enjoys my shows, and if you're somebody who spends an amount of time every month watching my programming, do me a favor, head on over to www.patreon.com slash John Campia. You'll get all the information there about what it means to be one of my Patreon supporters, why my Patreon supporters are the reasons my shows can even exist, and also all the benefits of being one of my Patreon supporters. Check that out. Maybe after reading that, if you decide you want to not just be a consumer, but you also want to contribute to this programming, awesome. And if not, that's perfectly fine too. I'm just glad you're here joining us talking about movies. All right, let's move on now to the next question. We've got two more questions to go, and then I'm going to go to the live stream from you guys. And the next question comes to us from Koba. And Koba writes, I just heard Fox is planning an X-23 movie, which has got me really excited. Though I will say my question is rather silly, but do you think Laura could end up wearing the yellow costume? Like her in the comic books, uh, uh, like in her comic books she reads. Okay, so... Here's the thing. What came out yesterday, uh, let's be clear about this. Let's bring some clarification to this. There are some headlines going around, and nobody's trying to be misleading. Don't, no one's trying to be misleading, okay? There are headlines going around saying, Fox planning an X-23 spinoff movie. That's not exactly true, okay? That's not exactly true. Again, nobody's trying to be misleading about it. Uh, not at all. It's just, but that's not exactly accurate. See, because when you say that... Fox is planning an X-23 movie. That implies that Fox has spun up the wheels, they've got things in production, they're circling release dates, blah, blah, blah. blah. That is not where we're at. All that's happened is a couple of the producers decided to get a writer and say, hey, write a script. Let's see where we go. Write a script. You have to understand that like one out of every 300 scripts that producers ask to get written or even studios ask to get written ever actually turn into a movie. It's simply them saying, well, okay, I mean, sure, let's look into the idea, write a script and let's see where we're at. I mean, that's all it really is. So to say Fox is planning an X-23 movie, that's not accurate. That's not exactly accurate. Again, I can understand why some people would use that as the headline completely. Like they're not being deceptive at all. Because, I mean, they are, somebody has asked a writer to write up a script with a couple of ideas. That has happened. So that, it's not unfair to say that. It's just that that's not exactly where we're at right now. Could this X-23, could a movie completely based on this character, Laura, who, how wonderful was she in Logan? One of the many reasons Logan is still the best movie of the year. Um, is it possible this could actually turn into a movie? Absolutely, it's possible. It's uh, the first step of 500 steps. The first step is for a producer to go, let's, uh, let's get a script, let's get a draft script written up and see where we're at. Let's see if there's some potential there. That's step one of 500. But they, we could l legitimately move there. I have my doubts. Again, I'm not saying it won't happen. Not at all. Somebody's going to say, Campy, you said it wouldn't happen. No, I'm not saying that. But I am saying I have my doubts. And there's a couple of reasons I have my doubts. Doubt number one, Laura and, and the actress who played her and uh, Keen, uh, Daphne Keen, who played her, was magnificent, okay? I wouldn't argue if somebody wanted to give her a Best Supporting Actress nomination at the Academy Awards. I wouldn't argue with it. I'm not expecting it, and I'm not screaming for it, but I wouldn't be surprised if, she, if somebody decided that this little girl here gets an Academy Award nomination. She was that good in the movie. But English is not her first language. And that's fine. When you have Patrick Stewart and Hugh Jackman there who can carry the, the bulk of the film 
and play off of that she can play off of and she's at her best when she's cussing out Hugh Jackman in Spanish I would just, I'm just loving it I mean that's when she was at her best in the movie but can you make her the centerpiece from a practical being audience friendly point of view can you make her the centerpiece of the movie I'm not sure about that she was brilliant in a supporting role can she carry a movie on her own? I don't know. I've never seen her try. I'm not saying she can't. I'm just saying I don't know. It's simple. I just don't know. The other potential problem is that the timeline in which the movie is set, because remember, this movie is set in the future. So now you're trying to do a movie without the X-Men, because remember, all the X-Men are gone. In this Logan dystopian future world, all the X-Men are gone. They're dead, so you're just kind of relying on her and these other kids. Will that work? I don't know. Now, you can always, if you want to put on your loser nerd hat, like we all do from time to time, and go, yes, but John Cable could time travel and go into the future and get her and bring her back to the past, which is our present, because he needs her help in forming the X-Men and helping the X-Men. Okay, yeah, 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 you, that's possible. Could totally do that. That is certainly plausible within the comic book universe. And Fox is continuity schmontinuity. That's absolutely one of the gists. But just at on face value, it is problematic. It is a little problematic how you can make this film that will appeal to a wide audience and get people coming out to see it. And I don't know if you can do it. I, I'm just saying I don't know. However, keep this in mind too. We talked about this on the show yesterday. Fox right now, far more than Marvel, far more than DC. Fox is taking chances. Fox are trying different things. Fox is willing right now to roll the dice. They did it with Logan. They did it with Deadpool. They're doing it clearly with uh, New Mutants. This would be a risk. Doing an X-23 movie would be a risk. It would be a literal roll of the dice. But out of any of the studios out there right now, Fox is the one that seems to be willing to go as far away from the formula as possible and completely trying new things. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't work. But they seem to have the brass nuts to give it a shot. And so I think the biggest chance that an X-23 movie has of actually making it through the 500 stages and actually hitting the screen is the fact that it's in Fox's hands. And Fox is the studio that seems to be willing to take unorthodox chances right now. And they're getting rewarded for it. Let's see if it works with New Mutants, but maybe we could see it turn out there. If I had to put an over-under on the chances of an X-23 movie based on Daphne Keene's portrayal of the character coming out, I would put it at a solid 30%. That's that's very realistic. That's a very realistic number. I think 30%, that gives it a real shot. I still think it's unlikely, but totally plausible. Let's see what happens with that. All right, let's move on now to the next question, which will be the final email question. And then I'm going to go to the chat board and start, or at least to the Twitter stream from you guys who are watching live and taking your live questions. And the final question today is one everybody's been talking about, which is this. This one comes to us from Elizabeth Tileman, who writes, I've seen a bunch of people tweeting that Justice League isn't going to be isn't going to let critics send out their reviews until the day before the movie comes out. Is this true? What possible reason would they have for doing this if they weren't trying to hide the reviews? All right, thanks a lot for that. And actually, last night, I put up a video on this exact issue. I put up a video of this last night, so you can go and check that out. I have that up on my YouTube channel. But to elaborate and expand on that a little bit. So for those of you who haven't heard, one of the writers from the website Indie Revolver, which is a good website, uh, put out on Twitter a screenshot of the message they got from a Warner Brothers PR person. And that basically said that all reviews are under embargo until November 15th, Wednesday, November 15th. The movie's official release date is November 17th, but really you and I all know that even though the official release date is November 17th, that really means that the movie hits theaters on November 16th. Because we all know that the movies now come out on Thursday night. That's when they hit theaters nationwide. So that's the 16th. So if this is true and we have no reason to suspect that it's not true it's possible it's not true but right now i think we're going to go on the assumption that it's true that means that warner brothers is requiring film critics who see their movie early to hold their reviews until the day before movie the movie hits theaters nationwide 
Now, that has always been, without exception, a giant red flag. That has always been a giant red flag. That, okay, so studios want positive word, word of mouth out about their movies. They want that. This studio isn't even going to let the critics say, tell people what they think about the movie until the day before it comes out. Therefore, they make the logical conclusion to them that that means the studio does not believe their movie's any good. The studio doesn't believe that this move that, that anybody's going to like this film, and therefore they don't want anybody telling other people that they didn't like the film until the last possible minute. That, that is normally, that is 99% of the time that is the case when you see a, a, an embargo not being lifted until the day before the movie comes out. That's sneaky. It's, that's, that is the studios trying to hide the movies. However, however, and I mentioned this in my video last night, there's a big giant asterisk we've got to put on this, okay? There is, you know, there is compelling circumstances here that would suggest to us maybe it's not so bad. And it's a very important point that we need to keep in mind, and that is this. The original embargo date for Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman, which the critics loved, right? The original embargo date for Wonder Woman was also the day before it hit theaters. That was the original embargo date for Wonder Woman, was the day before it hit theaters. But what they did was, about a week out from the movie, they bumped the embargo date back. And the, the reviews actually came out like a full four days before the movie ever hit. Tons of time for the reviews to disseminate around the web and for people to hear the reviews before the movie ever hit screen. Plenty of time. So that's what they did with Wonder Woman. There's nothing, I mean, there's no reason not to accept the possibility that that might be exactly what they're doing now. They might just be simply saying, as, as a placeholder, hey guys, review embargoes on November 15th. But it's very possible that all what they're really doing, because they may know this in advance, that they're just going to do the same thing they did with Wonder Woman, which is like a week out from Justice League hitting theaters, they'll go, oh, hey, by the way, guys, the review embargo, we're moving it up a bunch. Now you can release it tomorrow, you know? And that's very possible that that's what they're doing. They did it with Wonder Woman. There's no reason to suspect that's not what they could be doing with Justice League as well. So for somebody like me, I hear that they've got the review embargo the day before the movie comes out for Justice League. Is that concerning? Sure, it's a little concerning. But me and the panic button, I'm not pressing the panic button because we saw this play out with Wonder Woman. There is, in legal terms, there is precedent for this. We saw them do it with Wonder Woman and look how that turned out. Turned out great. All the reviews were glowing and positive and everybody liked the movie. That got the audience more excited to see it. That contributed to a big opening weekend. That could very well be what we have here. Now, I will say this. If Warner Brothers does not lift the review embargo, like they did with Wonder Woman, and that's exactly what I think they're going to do. But if they don't, yes, that would worry me. That will worry me. Because studios, like, look what Warner, Warner Brothers believes, positive word of mouth, positive online buzz, positive reviews helps their movie. You know Warner Brothers believes that because they did it with Wonder Woman. That's why they moved their embargo date up. And they reap the benefits of it because they had a great response. If they don't change that embargo date, as somebody who has been saying... Guys, Justice League is going to be just the second DCEU movie to have a 70% or higher. I believe this is going to be a really good movie, blah, 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 blah. I might be eating my words. If they don't change that date, I might be eating my words. Again, I believe they are going to change it. I fully, There's precedent. Just the last movie that came out proves it. I think they are going to move that embargo date. I think this is just part of their process. I think everything is going to be fine. I do. I'm just saying, on the small percent chance, if they don't move that embargo date, that's a red flag. I will admit, even though I have been sitting here saying it's going to be good, 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 even I will admit that's a red flag. Now, there are some people who are so desperate to believe that everything is fine, like me, um, that they're suggesting, oh, well, uh, if they don't move the review embargo date, that's just because they're trying to hide spoilers. That's being naive. That is being naive. Now, you might be able to point to one or two films in history that did that. 
um, you might be able to point to the 0.001% of that ever happening and saying, there, that's proof. No, no, look. Warner Brothers already showed with Wonder Woman that they embrace positive reviews and they believe positive reviews helps their movie. So don't tell me now with this, they're gonna they're just doing it to hide spoilers. Really? Guess what? You know what comes out before the review embargo? Justice League comes out publicly in a couple of countries before the review embargo even lifts. Like it's coming out, I know, in France, and I think in Switzerland and Sweden, and, and there's a couple of countries. Justice League is already going to be in theaters for the public to see and get online and talk about before the current review embargo lifts. Don't tell me they're trying to hide spoilers. You're only trying to hide spoilers if you are not releasing the movies around the world before the review embargo day. There's no way. There's no way. There is, the studios know there is a 10,000% chance that spoilers will come out from the average filmgoers going to see the movie in some European countries than they are from professional film critics. Okay? So don't, don't try to fall back on, oh, they're just doing it to hide spoilers. Oh, really? Then why are they releasing the movie in other countries before the review embargo lifts? Because they're trying to hide spoilers? Come on. Come on. That just totally defeats that argument completely. But again... I do not think there is a need or, or a reason to panic because, again, we already saw this play out with Wonder Woman. I, if I had to put a hundred bucks on it, I would bet a hundred bucks that Warner Brothers is gonna is already planning on lifting the review embargo earlier. Just for now, they're saying it's the day before the movie. So I believe there's no need to worry. I believe there's no need to panic. I believe everything will be fine. Um, and I think this is just part of their process. So you watch, you watch. Come November, the movie opens on the 17th, which really means the 16th. You watch. By like November 9th or November 10th, we're going to hear that Warner Brothers has now lifted the review embargo. We're going to hear it. We're going to hear it. So that's, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm counting on anyway as a fan of the genre. All right, guys, with all that out of the way, it's time for us to move over now to the live questions that you guys who are watching the show live are sending in. Once again, if you want to get a live question on, make sure you're following me on Twitter at John Campia and then tweet in to me simply at John Campia. Uh, let's see. Let's go over to this. And the first question, remember, I don't have time to, to screen these, so some of these questions might be great. Some of them might be terrible. But the first question comes to us today from Robo12323, who writes, John, worst theater experience you've ever had? Easily. I think, what was the, the Jim Carrey movie? Was it the number 21? I can't remember what the actual number was. It was either the number 21 or the number 13 or the number 65, whatever it is. Tell me in the chat board what the name of that... Um, uh, what the name of that Jim Carrey movie was. Jump in the chat board if you remember what it is. So anyway, I went to go see that. This is obviously years ago. It was up in Canada. And normally, like these nightmare stories, number 23, thank you everybody in the chat board, the number 23. So a lot of people have nightmare experiences. I, for the most part, never have bad experiences in movie theaters. It's very, very rare to me. And I've expressed this before, less and less am I seeing people using their cell phones in theaters. That's getting better and better. So normally, but, but this one time, and I might have told this story before, I can't remember. But me and my buddy were in watching 23. And there was this group of four idiot, wish their parents had considered birth control teenage girls behind us. Who just talked and cackled and talked and talked and laughed and giggled through the whole thing um until finally my buddy and this was inappropriate but i understood his thing is basically turned around and basically said i'm gonna beat the shit out of you <laughs> you know basically and they're like oh shit up blah 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 now eventually i think a staff member came down and got threw them out of the theater but that was easily the, the worst experience I've ever had in a movie theater. It was just terrible. And he didn't even have anything to do with the movie. Well, it didn't help that the movie wasn't any good. Maybe I should have been grateful to those girls for distracting me from the bad movie because it was a bad movie. But uh, that, that to me was my worst experience in a movie theater ever. I hope I never have one that's any worse than that. Okay, let's see this. Um, Entertainment Maniac. Uh, retweeting, is Marvel trying to hide the fact that DC films are kicking their asses? Only four movies uh, have been bad. <laughs> Look, 
I'm a fan of comic book movies, all right? I am a fan of comic book movies in general. I owe no allegiance to any corporate overlord master like a lot of other people out there, all right? None at all. I call Man of Steel a masterpiece, and I believe that completely. I think Man of Steel is a tragically underrated film. To date, I have never given a negative review for a DCEU film. I gave positive reviews to Man of Steel, to Batman vs. Superman, to Suicide Squad, to Wonder Woman, and I'm hoping I get to do the same to Justice League. I, I have given, go look them up. All my reviews have been positive reviews for those movies. I like the DC Cinematic Universe. I like DC films. And I love Man of Steel. <laughs> it's laughable at this point to say that DC is in the same league as Marvel right now. At least as far as the movies go right now. Is DC heading in the right direction I believe they are. I believe DC is heading absolutely in the right direction. I really do. I think five years from now, we're not going to see this disparity between where Marvel is at in terms of their success, in terms of their audience reactions, in terms of their critic reactions, in terms of their box office success, all that kind of stuff. There's a disparity right now between all of that good stuff and where DC is at. But I believe DC is closing the gap, and I believe Justice League is going to be the next step in closing that gap. But even I will tell you it is kind of pathetic and laughable to suggest that DC is even anywhere near Marvel right now in terms of audience reaction, critic reaction, box office success, um, all that kind of stuff. DC's just not close, let alone trying to suggest that they're ahead of Marvel. They're not. They're just not. Just look up every empirical piece of statistical data we have about cinema, cinema scores, about audience reactions, about critic reactions, about box office numbers. I mean, it's, it's just not an issue right now. But who cares? Look, if you're a smart film fan, when you walk into a movie, you don't care whether the Marvel logo pops up or the DC logo or the Fox logo pops up or whatever. A real movie fan doesn't care. You just go in, watch and appreciate or hate the movie based on the movie's own merits, not which corporate overlord the movie came from. That's what real film fans do. So, um... Anyway, that's why I get fr frustrated with uh, the, the Marvel zombie corporate slaves. That's why I get frustrated with the DC corporate zombie slaves. Uh, and and so I guess there are some Fox corporate zombie slaves out there too. By the way, Fox this year is kicking all their asses uh, with what they did with Logan. But, you know, look, just be a film fan. It's, it's this notion that DC is somehow ahead. Okay, you can say that and you can think that. If, if that's your opinion, you are entitled to that opinion. Nothing wrong with that. I celebrate that you have that opinion. But, but if you want to actually look at what empirical data there is about audience ratings, critic ratings, box office, things like that, um, you're, you're going to be disappointed. But that doesn't mean that has to change your opinion. Look, if you look up empirical data, everybody loves the original Blade Runner. Everybody loves it. But I don't. Just because there's empirical data that says everybody else loves uh, Blade Runner doesn't mean I'm supposed to change my opinion. It's my opinion. And if you prefer DC way over Marvel, that's awesome. There's nothing wrong with that. I celebrate that. That's good for you. Just because like some number somewhere says, well, the majority of people prefer Marvel films. Who cares? That doesn't mean you're supposed to change your opinion. Just don't say it's fact that DC is better than Marvel when there might actually be some empirical evidence to the contrary. But you know what? Who cares? It's all about what you like and your experience with the movies. That's what's important, regardless of whichever corporate label gets slapped on a movie. Anyway, let's move on to the next uh, question here. And the next question on Twitter comes to us from SM Sequeed, who writes, John, do you think that Star Wars The Last Jedi will cross $2 billion like The Force Awakens? I answered this the other day, no. I, I honestly don't. I think it's going to be crazy successful. I think it's going to make crazy amounts of money. It's going to like be one of the top 10 biggest box office films of all time. But do I believe it will become the fourth member of the $2 billion club? No, I do not. I also don't think Avengers, Age of, or, uh, Avengers um, Infinity War will either. I, I don't think that will either. So I don't see any movie in the near future crossing that $2 billion mark, and that includes uh, Star Wars The Last Jedi. I think it's going to be great. I think it's going to make huge amounts of money. It's going to be a giant success. But I don't think, and maybe I'm wrong. Hopefully I'm wrong. But I do not think it's going to cross the $2 billion mark. Uh, let's see. Next one comes to us from Dragomir6991, who writes, John, 
What sci-fi movie do you think is underappreciated? For me, it's Gattaca with Ethan Hawke. Well, I mean, there are many sci-fi movies that are underappreciated. And Gattaca is certainly one of them. Uh, with good old handsome Hawk. Uh, Gattaca is a strong... It's a real thinking man's kind of sci-fi movie. It's a really good one, so I enjoy that too. There's another one with Ethan Hawke. It's kind of a vampire movie, but it's also sci-fi. Um, what was the name? Oh, damn it. It's Sam Neill's in it, too. I am forgetting the name of the movie. It's Something Before Dark or something that's got Ethan Hawke. It's got Sam Neill. You guys in the chat board, do you know which like vampire movie I'm talking about where vampires have basically taken over the world and there's not a lot of humans left and they have to basically farm humans because there's a worldwide blood shortage now? Do you guys... Dawnbreakers, thank you very much. I knew I could always rely on the live chat board. Dawn, Daybreakers, that's it. Daybreakers is the name of the movie. Really good one. That's one to check out. I'm sure there are many others that I would list off if I sat down and thought about it, but I'd have to think about that. But Gattaca is definitely a good one to put on there. Uh, let's see. Next one comes to us from Damn You 83 I love some of your Twitter names, guys. And Damn You 83 writes... I'm going to see it either way. I actually like BVS, and my largest complaint about the film was addressed. Well, yeah, look, I think a lot of people should see it either way. Like, look, even if what I do not think is going to happen happens, which is they keep that embargo date, and I don't think they will. But even if they do, that's just concerning. That shouldn't stop you from going out to see it. You should still go out and see it if if you are so inclined to see it. I'm not saying everybody has to go see it, but if you're somebody that you're so inclined to check out a Justice League movie, yes, it would be concerning to me if they kept that date, but you should still go see it and because maybe the concerns will be unfounded. Never know, right? If you're looking forward to the movie, you go see it. That's the important thing. All right, next one. Um, a. Clay 19 writes, John Campion, what do you think uh, are Get Out's Oscar chances? For Best Picture, very, very low. I think, I, look, I think Get Out's a very good movie. I enjoyed it a lot. And, um, th I mean, the fact that it was the first movie he's ever directed is even more impressive. The fact that it's a low-budget horror is even more impressive. I do not think it stands up to the best films of the year, but I think Get Out is a treasure of a movie. I thought it was really great. I cannot wait to see what, uh, you know, what he does next as far as, because he's just going to get better as a director. He's just going to get better and better and better. But right now, I'd say the Oscar chances are actually pretty low. I think they're pretty low. Uh, let's see. This one comes to us from Victor Sensei, who writes, John, if it's true and the runtime for Justice League is now two hours, that suggests that there's even more of Joss Whedon in the film. Yes, Maybe yes, maybe no. I mean, who knows? Like, Warner Brothers may have given a directive even before they started shooting Justice League. Hey, guys, this movie's got to be tighter and move better. It's got to have better pace and better flow. They might have said that long before uh, Joss Whedon got involved. So it might suggest it. But here's the thing to me. This is driving me crazy. These people going... Justice League is only two hours. Well, that means it's going to suck. What the fine fuck are you talking about? You know what movie was two hours? Star Wars was two hours and five minutes. Two hours and five minutes. Yeah, but John, like, Justice League has to introduce us to some new characters like, like Cyborg and Aquaman. And we were getting introduced to new characters. It's got to be more than four hours. You know what? You know what Star Wars had to do? Star Wars had to introduce you to Luke Skywalker, to C-3PO, to R2-D2, to Obi-Wan Kenobi, to Chewbacca, to Han Solo, to Darth Vader. It had to introduce you to Tarkin and the whole idea about this whole galactic universe in the first place, the Death Star, the whole bit. It had to do that. Guess what? It did it in two hours, and the movie's just fine. Yeah, but John, this is a modern comic book movie. You need more time than that. You know how long Guardians of the Galaxy was? Guardians of the Galaxy was two hours. And you know what? They had to introduce us to five totally brand new characters. They had to introduce us to Star-Lord. They had to introduce us to Gamora. They had to introduce us to, Gla to Drax. They had to introduce us to Groot. They had to introduce us to that damn raccoon. They had to introduce us to like all the villains involved in the film. They had to introduce a whole bunch of stuff. That movie was damn good. It got great critic ratings, great audience ratings, huge success at the box office, two hours long. Tell me again why Justice League has to be longer than two hours? Tell me again. Because I'm so every example I can point out to you says it doesn't need to be. Now look, I said this before. I will say it again. 
We like maybe we'll watch it and think, wow, two hours. We might watch Justice League and say, you know what? It was just too long. This was a good movie, but if you trimmed about 15 minutes out of it, it would have been a nice, leaner, tighter, faster paced movie. It would have had more killer, less filler, would have just even been better at, at 15 minutes shorter. Or we might see it and go, okay, now that I've seen it, it needed about 20 extra minutes to give it a little bit more room to breathe or whatever. Blah, blah, blah. But there's, it's pointless to honestly discuss. Does Justice League need to be shorter or longer before we've seen the movie? We will never know until we see the movie if we feel that it should have been shorter or longer. But I reject this ludicrously dumb idea that it needs to be longer. Sorry, lots of great movies in history have been two hours or shorter that had to introduce us to even more characters and they are some of the all-time greatest movies ever. So don't tell me it needs to be shorter. And maybe you're somebody who just prefers your movies longer. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that. And it's very cool for you to say, I would prefer it to be longer. That's great. That's fine. Nothing wrong with that whatsoever. But this notion that two hours, well, that means it's going to suck. Come on. Come on. Use your heads. It, it doesn't mean that at all. Now, maybe the movie will suck. Okay. Okay. But if it does, it won't be because it was two hours. Maybe we'll see it and we'll feel like it does need to be longer. Okay, fine. Maybe that'll happen. That's fine. Maybe that'll happen. Maybe we'll see and go, oh, that should have been a little bit shorter. The point is, there's no point in saying that it's a bad thing it's two hours until we know whether or not that's the case. And we will not know till we see it. It's just that simple. Anyway, sorry, I get ranting on that. <laughs> so I don't mean to rant that much. All right, let's go on to the next question. Um... Let's see. And this one comes to us from uh, Mickey7382 writes, John, does the director have a say in the embargo date or is it the studio's decision? Actually, more specifically than the studio's decision, it's the uh, distributor's decision. Now, sometimes the distributor and the studio are one in the same company. Often it's not. Well, oftentimes you have a production company and then you have a separate distributor. It's the distributor's decision. Now, when you ask, does the director have a say? Well, I'm sure that if the director has an opinion about it, he'll express it. And I'm sure that the distribution company or the studio involved will listen and maybe weigh that in their decision-making process. But does the director get a vote? Nope. At least 9,999 times out of 10,000. No, the director does not get a vote. He does not get to say when they remark date. That pretty much always lies with the film distributor because it's their decision to make. So that's where it usually lies. Uh, let's see. This one comes to us from Negasonic David who writes, Hey John, do you want an R rated DC movie? If yes, which one would you like? Greetings from Columbia. I don't care. In asking, do I want an R rated DC movie? Uh, movie? The answer is no. Are there movies that you could pitch to me that might benefit from an R rated, from an R rating? Sure. I guess there would be some uh, things that you could pitch to me. But same thing with Marvel. Do I want an R-rated Marvel movie? No. With Fox, do I want an R-rated Fox movie? But you pitch to me a Deadpool movie. Okay. Yep. That would benefit from an R rating. That's fine. You pitch to me the type of movie that Logan ended up being. Okay. I could see that. But do I want an R-rated DC movie just for the sake of it? Like, am I so immature that I got to see boobs? That, that that's just oh if they don't say fuck five times then i don't like it as much am i that immature i don't need that i don't need it just give me a good movie christopher nolan's batman movies none of them were rated r they were dark in tone they were gritty they were violent they were great but that doesn't mean there aren't some concepts that wouldn't benefit from an r rating so in asking the general question do i want an r-rated movie no no i'm fine without r-rated movies are there concepts you could pitch that would benefit from an R-rated movie and maybe you should do it R-rated? Absolutely there are. We've proved that, but do I just, as a flat general thing, want an R-rated movie? No, I don't care. I just want a good movie. That's all I care about. I could care less about what the rating is. All right. Next one comes to us from Matt Yamasaki, who writes, John, would Logan be in your top 10 movies of all time? No. No. It's, it's, it's up there. It might be in my top 20. All time, no. It's not The Godfather. It's not, uh, you know, it's not uh, Lawrence of Arabia. It's not Star Wars. It's not... Logan is still my number one film of the year. It's magnificent. Top 10 films of all time. Maybe there are many of you who would put on your top 10 films of all time. Awesome. 
For me personally, I, I no, I don't think I don't think it, it gets in there just yet. All right, let's try this one. This one comes from R Drago sixty six who writes, John. Aside from Fastbender, what other actors is is time to stop giving the benefit of the doubt when it comes to picking films? That's a good question because you know I recently have been talking about Michael Fassbender is probably the best direct or probably the best actor in the world who has absolutely no good judgment when it comes to picking which movies to be in. Like Light Between Oceans, Assassin's Creed, The Snowman. I mean, he's just picking really bad films to be in. He's he's a world class actor. He's definitely world class actor. No question about that. Uh, another actor who's like that. I don't know. That's, that's actually you know, a really good good question. Let's pose that to the live chat board. You guys, who are some actors right now that we're not talking about their acting ability, whether they're good or bad, but just don't pick very good movies to be a part of. Jump into the comment section. Let me know which uh, which actors you think uh, Johnny Depp is being brought up. Now, he is in the Murder on the Orient Express, but you're right. Johnny Depp has been in a number of really qu questionable films as well. Um, yeah, if you guys got any other ideas, jump them in there. Okay, just going to take a couple more here. This next one comes to us from Paco Bella, who writes, John, is it possible that the Justice League embargo uh, is that date because Josh won't be done the film until then? Okay, I'm glad you brought that question up because I have been hearing people asking me that question. John, maybe the review embargo is that because Whedon literally won't be done the film until the 15th. We've seen that happen before, actually with Joss Whedon. I remember sitting down and doing an interview with Joss Whedon once and he was like a mess. He was a wreck. He said, and he told me, I literally just finished the movie last night. I'm like last night. However, even though the review embargo doesn't lift to the 15th, they are showing it to critics probably about a week before that. So the movie is going to be done before they show it to the critics. And the critics are going to be reviewing the movie they see. So while I totally understand why you would ask the question, absolutely, no, because they're showing it to the critics well before that. So that means the movie's going to be done at least a week before the movie comes out, the movie will be done, because they're showing it to the critics. Now, if for whatever reason they cancel the critic screenings, um, then they're... Actually, I still don't think it'll be because the movie's not done, because if you're not going to be done the movie until two days before the movie comes out, you should bump the release date. You should push the release date into like January or February 2018. But I would say it's not impossible. I would say it's not impossible, but if they show it to the critics like they're already planning on it, that means the movie's going to be done already. Good, good thinking, though. Like, good thought process. All right. Uh, let's see. Next one comes to us from... I can't find my spot. Where am I? Uh, let's see. Okay, this one. Uh, one Mr. Wayne Run says, uh, writes, trying to hide the reviews. Pff, don't be that silly. Sorry, dude. If you want to be blindly naive and stick your head in the sand and pretend like there are unicorns flying in the skies, woo, then be my guest. Be that naive. But that is what studios do. I'm not talking about Justice League specifically, but it is common practice. That's what studios do when they are trying to hide reviews. It's a common practice. It happens at least 15, 20 times a year that studios will either A, just have the review embargo lift the day before the movie comes out, or B, have the review embargo lift the, the day the movie comes out. And it is 99.999% of the time that the studios are hiding the film. So if you want to be a naive, you know, little something who talks to unicorns and blue fairies and whatever else, and you have your own personal snuffle up, I guess, and you just want to stick your head in the sand and say, la, 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 nothing's wrong. You be my guest. Now, I am, again, I'm not saying that's the situation with Justice League. I think that the Warner Brothers is going to lift that review embargo early. I think there's nothing to worry about. That's why what I will tell anybody who asks me, I think there's nothing to worry about because we saw with Wonder Woman, they had the same review embargo date and then lifted it early. I believe they're going to do the same thing with Justice League. I think that's part of Warner Brothers' pattern, so I think there's nothing to worry about. But to say, oh, that's silly to think that holding a review embargo to the day before the movie's coming out, that's silly to say that's them hiding reviews. Sorry, dude, that's the fact. That has been the established pattern in Hollywood with all the studios. That's, that's the established pattern. So I would say pull your head out of the sand. Again, I don't think that's the situation with Justice League, but... Yeah, I mean, just 
Time to embrace the real world, my friend, my brethren, Mr. Wayne One. All right, next one comes to us um, from Victor Lin 212 who writes, John, which studio has the best marketing strategies? Do studios have set strategies or does it depend on the film? I really think it depends on the film because you look at like one of the best marketing campaigns that we've seen in the last number of years. I think we'll all agree whether you love the movie or hate the movie is Deadpool. I mean, the Deadpool marketing campaign was pure genius and brilliance. But Fox doesn't always have great marketing campaigns for the movies. As a matter of fact, like Warner Brothers has had some killer marketing campaigns. They've also had some terrible ones. Disney's had some killer marketing campaigns. They've also had some terrible ones. I mean, every studio, I really do believe it goes on a movie by movie basis. Every movie has its own unique DNA. And how do we market this particular movie to the audience? What is the best way to sell this particular movie in all of its uniqueness to the audience? And therefore, I think it goes on a case by case basis. All right. Um, let's see. Next one comes to us from Jay Hutch 137 who writes, John, are you looking forward to Will Smith's Netflix movie, Bright? I can't wait to see it. I'm curious about it. Again, they really pushed this movie pretty hard at Comic-Con this past year. I am looking forward to it. The only reason I'm not super excited for it is because only about one out of every 10 original Netflix movies that hits their service is any good. They don't have a very good track record. For every Okja, for every Beast of No Nation, you get about 20 or 30 other really bad things that they put out that they call Netflix originals. So we'll have to see. So I'm look, I think the trailer's interesting. It's got a very strong, heavy, aka ripoff feeling of Alien Nation. Remember that movie from the 80s? But, uh, I mean, every movie you can find something that ripped off from another movie. That's art. Uh, but it looks good. It does look good. I just... I, uh, it's a Netflix movie, and I normally get disappointed with Netflix movies, so I'll wait and see it, and we'll see how it goes. I am looking forward to it, though. Okay. Uh, Tyrone Steele writes, John, update on the possible weekly show on CW Show Reviews you said you might do. Okay, I will tell you, that I shouldn't even say this, because I haven't really thought it out yet, but I will tell you this. Um... There's so much television and so much, I mean, uh, look, eight out of every 10 email questions that get sent in to me are revolve around the comic book genre. Like the fact that I only use about like half of the questions on the show are about comic book movies is because I have to go through and really pick out questions that are not comic book movie related. And that's, and I try to keep a balance, but I have been thinking about since I do a weekly show, that's just all about Star Wars. Cause I love Star Wars. I am thinking about doing a weekly show that is all talking about the comic book superhero TV shows and comic book superhero news that came out that week. Uh, I'm thinking about doing, I mean, I do a sum up show on Star Wars. Maybe I want to do it on my other favorite genre, which is that. I'm thinking about calling it The Weekly Hero. Um, I'm thinking about it. Haven't totally decided. Hang tight. And uh, hopefully I'll be able to give, let you know for officially like within the next 48 hours. But thank you a lot. Thanks a lot for the question. Um, let's see. Last question I will take today comes to us from John Hayek, who writes, are you a fan of any of the Saw movies? Any expectations for Jigsaw? Well, I do really like the first Saw movie. I like the second Saw movie, too. I haven't really liked any of the other ones after that, but the first two I enjoy quite a bit. I'm looking forward to this new one. I think the trailers have been really good. And um, let's see. Let's see what happens. Do they actually raise Jigsaw from the dead? Is Are they going to go supernatural on us? I don't know. I doubt it. But we'll have to see. All right, guys, that will do it for me for this installment of the John Campia Show. Thank you so much for joining me. Listen, don't forget, if you like these videos, make sure, take a second, guys, go down and click the thumbs up button. Give this, vo this video a thumbs up. Leave a comment. Remember, all of us are film fans together. We're all film and television fans. We're all on the same team, even if you like one movie and somebody else likes another. So let's go into the, the chat board. Let's have debates and discussions and disagreements because that's the fun thing about being a film fan. But let's do it remembering we're all on the same side. We're all fans together. So let's just be civil to each other while we're passionately debating the films and TV shows we love versus the films and TV shows we hate. Let's let's have a good time doing it. Let's just keep it fun. Uh, also, guys, make sure you're following me on social media, so on Facebook and on Twitter. You can follow me at John Campia. That will do it for me for today, guys. Thank you again so much for joining me. My name is John Campia, and until the next show, bye-bye.